Greetings, Macaulay here. Ben is off this week, furthering the budding chess careers of today's youth. So, we're bringing you a chat with Chessbase co-founder and former chief editor of Chessbase.com, Frederick Friedel. Part interview, part oral history. I spoke with Frederick in the Chessbase studio in Hamburg a few weeks ago about his personal guest book, The Origins of Chessbase, and how the chess world has changed over the last 40 years. We'll be putting some photos and scans that accompany the stories you hear in this interview on Chessbase.com, and you can also find a link on PerpetualChessPod.com as well. Once again, if you want to support the podcast, besides becoming a patron, you can use the special referral link in the show notes or on perpetualchesspod.com slash chessbase to place an order on anything from the Chessbase shop. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. On Perpetual Chess, I have weekly conversations with the chess world's best players, promoters, and educators about their lives, careers, current projects, and best practices. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. I'm Macaulay Peterson, the editor-in-chief of Chessbase. And I'm pleased to be joined by the co-founder of Chesspace and, shall we say, Chief Editor Emeritus, Frederick Friedel. Something like that. You took over from me, but I did it for 20 years, every day. Three articles on average. Well, we have a lot of stories to get to over the next hour or so. And I actually wanted to start with something that was published recently on Chesspace, an article about uh, the 1980 documentary featuring Nigel Short. Uh, We have some fantastic black and white pictures of a teenage Nigel being subject to experiments. That was also sort of your introduction to the chess world. You've now been in the chess world for 40 years. Wow, yes. uh, How did you uh, first enter the the world of chess back in the the late 70s? Well, it it was strange because I was... Uh, I studied philosophy. I started with Greek philosophy, but then migrated to modern philosophy, which is the philosophy of science, linguistic philosophy, epistemology, uh, things like that. And I started a university career, but there was no chance of me becoming uh, a professor at the university. A professor had to die for me to get a job there. So... I looked around and I became a science journalist. I started doing science documentaries and had a gorgeous four or five years of making all kinds of interesting science documentaries for television in Germany. And then one day I went to my boss, who was a very famous uh, science journalist, and said to him, did you know that computers can play chess? And he said, gone, in German, evo. No, no way. And I said, yeah, no, they're playing chess now. I'm pretty good. And so we discussed it, and then we decided to make a science documentary on how computers play chess and can play chess at all. And we made a very nice uh, and very successful documentary where David Levy, who had betted that for 10 years no computer would beat him, played against a computer in our studio with a huge mechanical arm moving the pieces, controlled by a computer in America, in Minneapolis. And it was very successful, so the other channel came to me and said, let's do one ourselves. And this time uh, we concentrated on the difference between human thinking and computer thinking. And we needed subjects, so I invited a young boy, a very talented young boy to come to Hamburg and play in the tournament which was staged there. And he came, his parents sent him alone without anyone, he was about 14 or just turned 15. And I remember I arranged that Lufthansa would uh, chaperone him uh, at the airport in Düsseldorf because when I picked him up I was looking for a little child but it was a six foot tall almost strapping young lad, Nigel Short. And this was the first time I got to know Nigel. He came and stayed in my home. We did a lot of uh, 
filming with him. And that was what I... I scanned some of the pictures and uh, I found this morning pictures like this. This is Nigel at the time in our garden. And we had a great time. He came again and again and again and again. And probably 20 or 30 times he came to stay at our home. So Nigel, short, looking uh, quite boyish with uh, long hair. What he did was very interesting. He looked very feminine at the time. And he would go to the tournament with a teddy bear and so on, put it on, on the table. And the Eastern European grandmasters he was playing against found this very disconcerting. And they didn't know, oh, am I playing a girl or a boy? What's the teddy bear? Is this a child? But of course, he was very, very strong. And that was the very first meeting when I picked him up at the airport and realized that he was much taller than I expected. So then later that year, you uh, had your opportunity to meet Gary Kasparov for the first time in Dortmund. We we also have this, this photo of, of Nigel and Gary together, which in retrospect is uh, quite fascinating because you you probably don't have too many future world championship contenders at that age uh, smiling uh, together. Tell a little bit about that event in Dortmund, especially how you met Gary was quite unusual. Well, what happened was now I was friends with Nigel and he was playing in the Junior World Championship in Dortmund. So I went to visit him and by the way, I met one of my best friends in chess ever. This was John Nunn. He was Nigel's second. And so he became also a friend. He also came to visit very often. And I was walking on the street or I was hanging out on the street outside the tournament hall when I was approached by a young man who came to me and said the famous words, five to three, draw you win, five dollars a game. Now, that for the uninitiated, that means five minutes to three minutes, a time odds game. What he was saying is, you get five minutes, I get three minutes. If the game is a draw, it means you win, and it's five dollars a game. He had cleared everyone else out. So I said to him, no, 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 I know who you are, don't, because he assumed I was talking to Nigel and to John, and he had no idea who I was. So he thought maybe I'm a grandmaster second or something, or helping these two, and decided, since he had cleaned out everyone else, nobody was playing against them. At these conditions, he tried to get me. Later at the dinner, closing dinner, I sat down next to him and I chatted with him. And he claims he remembers that. I don't think so, but because for five years we didn't have any more contact. And this was Gary in 1980. You know. Now, at that point, he he actually was winning the World Junior Championship um, easily. In that in that uh, time, and and was you know already uh, uh, obviously on the on the radar of of everybody in the chess world. But did you have a sense of you know that you were talking to somebody uh, who was going to go on to do great things? Of course, of course, everyone knew that. And for this reason, what happened was, I read in a newspaper article that he had been he had given a symbol in London, and they had given him a computer, which was the B famous BBC Acorn computer and I had the same computer at home so what I did was I made a floppy disk many of your our readers will not know what that is it's a floppy disk which had data on it it was actually it's, floppy yeah it was floppy <laughs> <laughs> you know what it well is. The, the, then there were floppy disks quote unquote that were actually quite hard and not not no, flexible this so. was the real floppy yeah I, I'm agent. just I'm just old enough to uh, to have had some experience with the original floppy version okay I, I copied some games onto it and I put it into an envelope and wrote on the envelope Gary Kasparov Baku USSR that's all. I didn't have his address or anything. And I posted it, and uh, nothing happened. And a few months later, he came to Hamburg to play against Robert Hübner, a practice match. He had just had his long match against Karpov, which had been interrupted, and the next match was planned for the end of the year. So he came for a practice match against Robert Hübner in Hamburg. And when they asked him, what do you want to do on Sunday? It's a free day. He said, I want to visit a friend in Hollenstedt, which is 
a town outside of Hamburg. And they said, how could you know Hollenstedt? And who is this friend? So he said, I have a friend. And so he came, rang my bell, came in and said, hi, I'm Gary. You're Frederick? Okay, this is your wife. Mm. And these are your two kids. Very nice and beautiful house. That's a nice garden. Okay, now we're friends. Can we talk about computers? He came to find out what are computers and what can computers do for chess. And this story has been told a number of times in his first autobiography, which is called Child of Change. He spoke about that. He wrote about that. And now more extensively in his latest book, which is a very nice book, interesting, very interesting book. It's called Deep Thinking. And he describes how he came there and he played the game and he got crushed by my three-year-old son in this computer game and how that changed his attitude towards young people and computers. It's very interesting. But what he did was he sat down together with me every evening during the match and we discussed computers. I told him what computers can do and he told me what computers should do for the chess world, which is amazing because he had access to more information than anyone else in the world except maybe for Karpov. He was very privileged in this, but he was looking for making this information available to everyone. So we designed a kind of a chess database. But this was this predates Chessbase itself as oh, a company. Of course. Chessbase was nowhere in sight yet. And Gary and I we drew up a plan to make something which he said to me, your, what do you call it? A database. Yes, we must make a database. So we drew up a plan and described it. And and uh, the Spiegel, which was, uh, which was a big news magazine here and was the host of the match against Hübner, they published this. Friedel and Kasparov are planning to make a chess database. So every crackpot in Germany called and said, we have one or we can do one. And I actually traveled to a few, but they just wanted access to Kasparov. So I didn't know what to do. I'm not a programmer. And then one day, a young man approached me and said, yeah, Mr. Friedel, you want to create a database? Here's a disk. This was a small floppy disk, but one of the hard kind. And he handed it over to me and turned around and walked away. And it had his address. I took it home, stuck it into my Atari. And it was a rudimentary chess database, which means you had lots of games and you could load them and you could replay them and play through the moves backwards and so on. And this was Matthias Willenweber, a physics student. And then at some stage I said to Matthias, I called him and I said, this is very, very interesting. Would you be able to come to Zurich to show it to someone? And he said, yes, I could. To whom? And I said, well, Gary Kasparov. And I heard a thud. Matthias fainting. No, actually he didn't. But he told he confessed to me later that at that time he had once seen and been in the same room with an international master and was so proud of that. So he came he hitchhiked actually to Zurich and he came there and we set up an Atari and he loaded the program and Gary was playing against Tony Miles. And after the game, I said to Gary, come, I want to show you something. He said, Fred, I'm tired. I said, no, just come. So he came in. He saw Matthias sitting there. He wanted to leave. He doesn't want to meet new people when he's tired. So I said, no, come, sit down. So he sat on my bed, and Matthias showed him the database. Gary didn't say a word. He just watched it. And then suddenly he threw himself back on the bed and lay there with closed eyes. And Matthias looked at me and, you know, we're boring him, yeah? He's, he, he thinks this is just too stupid or what. And then a minute later, Gary jumped up and said, this is the most important development in chess study since the invention of printing. This was like, you know, like Armstrong landing on the moon. He had to find the right words, so he was thinking about them. And then Gary, you know, he just encouraged us. He said, you have to do this, Fred, Matthias. You have to. F so we founded Chessbase. And he kept 
encouraging us and always asking us, how far have you got? Can it do this? It must do that, and so on, and advising us and so on. And then there was a very important phase. I think it was 1996 or 97 January when we had the program ready, Chess Base 1.0, and was just ready. And Gary came to Hamburg to play against the German team, the, the Hamburg team. Bundesliga team, which contained a number of grandmasters. It was eight players, and he had played against them a year before, and he had lost three and a half to four and a half because they were hideously strong. Murray Chandler on board one, you know. And so he said, I'll get revenge, and he came back. This time, I gave him a disc which said chess base 1.0, Serial number 00001 and said I had a computer there in his room in the Atlantic Hotel and I said okay let's uh, prepare so I called the team and asked who's playing and which color and they told me and dictated I said okay now we have to prepare against these players and he said okay I'll go down and have a coffee or something and when you're ready I said I am ready and he said how can that be so I said, okay, let's try. We type in the first name, Matthias Valls, and bang, we get 30, 40 games. And now you can play through them. And he said, you know, Fred, this is a new era because in the past, if something like this happened, my seconds would say, okay, we'll come back in a week. And they'd come back with piles of books with little notes in them and slips of paper in them and you require 10 seconds? So he started studying them, and he studied all the players. And then I saw something which I think nobody has ever seen before or since. I would go onto the stage and find out which is which player, and then he would be introduced, and he would come on the stage, and I'd introduce him to the chess players, his opponents. And one of them was called Sön Kemaus, and I said, Gary, this is Sun Kemaus, and his, his playing strength is 25, 30, or whatever. And Gary said, ah, Sun Ke, hi, and gave him his hand like this, and then went on to the next. And Sun Ke was saying, that looked like he recognized me, but he's never met me, and he's never heard of me or anything. How can, why did he behave like that? Because he did know him. He knew everything about Sun Ke. He knew that he plays the, I don't know what, poison pawn. He gets nervous if his king is under attack. He suffered a dreadful loss in some line. He knew everything about Sönke. And, you know, he won it seven to one. He just wiped them off the board. And then we traveled to many, many places. We played against the French team twice, against the Swiss national team, against the German junior team, against the... Uh, U.S. junior team, then against the full German, uh, full German Olympiad team with four s strongest grandmasters, which he also won. These are all in simultaneous. Yeah, clock symbols, you know, where he's playing with the same time as they have, and this one was with Vlastimil Hort, who was a world championship challenger, Matthias Valls. Uh, and two other players, uh, and he won that clock symbol. So we did a lot of uh, this together, and it was fun, always with preparation using chess base. And what Gary did for us was he did all of these, and he would do press conferences before these symbols and show people, this is how I prepare, this is chess base, and with chess base I can do this. Without it, it would be impossible. And this is the program, and Frederick has this company and they're selling the program. So he did promotion and endorsement and so on for 10 years for us. Of course, we had to pay for it. Uh, we paid exactly what? 0, 0.00 German marks. Because, you know, I was sort of part of his family now. And you don't charge a cousin or an uncle for this kind of thing. So Fred, come on. No. No need. So, you know, I owe a lot to Gary. And the company, Chessbase, just sort of grew and grew and grew. Today, as you know, 
we have about 30 people working here. And we have a huge operation in chess. And everyone who plays chess is using it, just like Gary did in the first days of chess base, is using it to prepare for informal games, club games, tournaments, world championships. Well, one of the remarkable things you mentioned, Gary, at the, this point was like family, but you've actually had so many of these world champions and world champion challengers staying in your house. Like all of them, you yeah. know. I was, I was uh, amazed also that you uh, had the, the foresight to start a, a guest book from very early days in which a lot of this is, is chronicled. One of the first ones was actually Nigel, which would have been, uh, I guess, not long after this uh, 1980 documentary experiment meeting. Yes. He, he, he came very often and he sent his brother and then his other brother and then his parents and so on to visit us and Nigel was there very often John Nunn was there very often and Gary came for the first time in 1985 this was when he played against Hübner and he was in my house I would read this to you I would love to read it to you but it's in Russian so we'll we'll have to get the translation uh, <laughs> and we can uh, we can have a look at it later but this uh, you, yeah some some of them wrote nice messages some of them drew pictures um, there's even some photographs in there it really is kind of a, a history of the last uh, few decades of of world champions as well so yeah you you had not only Short and Kasparov who would later go on to play a match but also Anand Leko Kramnik. And, uh, well, everyone basically up until Carlson uh, has actually stayed in your house for sometimes weeks uh, overall. Oh, many, many, many times. Shall we go on to Anand? Yeah, let's, let's talk about Vishu because he, I think – has he stayed there like more than anyone, 30-plus times? No, John Nunn is the Nunn, record okay. holder. But he was 35 times, I think, Vishu was there. And he'd come all the time. And it was very interesting how I got to know Vichy. Would you like to hear this? Yeah, how did you meet, first meet him? He also as a teenager. I was at a tournament in London and I was doing bulletins with Chess Base, with the latest, the new Chess Base program. And somebody introduced me to a young Indian boy. And he came over and I said, okay, hi, where are you from? And Chennai and, oh, it was called Madras at the time. And he told me a little bit about himself and I asked him at some stage, how strong are you? And he said, like, 2,500. And I said, what? Who are you? And he said, Vishy Anand. And I said, listen, I need to talk to you. And then I finished my bulletin. And half an hour later, he came to me and he said, listen, I have to go back to my hotel. Do you have time now? He was standing there waiting. I said, yes, of course. And I walked him to the uh, underground. And it turned out that he would be playing in a, in a different tournament three weeks later. And I said, what do you do? You go back to India? And he said, no, no, I can't afford that. So I said, you hang out in some third class hotel? He said, no, no, fourth class hotel. So I said, listen, you seem a nice kid. Would you like to visit us when you're in Europe and playing? You could come and visit us and stay with us. And a couple of months later, I got a call saying, were you serious? I said, yeah, yeah, sure. And he said, okay, I'd like to come then and then. And so I picked him up at the uh, station, and he came, and my wife said, another chess prodigy? Is he nice? And Are you sure? And he's going to stay a full week? Little did she know that this was... <laughs> yeah. And then he came, and after about an hour, the entire family... The wife and the two sons said, he's great, you know, he can come any time. And they had a lot of fun. Of course, we had a slight problem with them because in the evening he said, no, oh, sorry, I don't eat meat. And then he said, oh, no, no fish either. And then he said, no, no eggs, no this and that. And I said, why don't you go into the garden and graze? That's the only thing we had. But it had a very important follow-up because we had to feed him somehow. And we bought a book on South Indian vegetarian food, which is what he eats. And it turns out the best food I'd ever eaten. And till today, we continue cooking South Indian vegetarian with their spices and their techniques and their rasams and their sambars and so on. 
and we learnt it from him. And then he came again and again and again, and we had a great time with him. Just as, a, as an aside, Vichy was also actually the winner of the cooking competition in Norway chess recently, uh, <laughs> yes. which he was paired up with Ding Loren. He actually cooked himself. Yeah, yeah, and, and they were judged to be the best team. Uh, well, when he first came to us, he, he showed skill in boiling water, nothing more. So he's learned a lot from his wife. His wife's an excellent cook, and I've learned a lot from her, Aruna. She came a number of times to our place, and I went to their home in Spain, and I learned the basic techniques from her. But at this point in your early visits from Vichy, this was long before they had met, but I gather he was also very interested in computers by this point and how to work with these new tools that he you were was developing. Amazing. He got he got access to the very early versions of Chessbase, and we were building a data department. So I would get data, and I'd put a disk in, and he would sit there watching the games, laughing, uh, giggling. Sometimes he'd come and drag me over from the living room to the study. you got to see this, Fred. And he'd show me a game which I didn't understand, but look what he did, and so on. And he was enjoying himself tremendously. And one day at breakfast, I said to him, he said to me, there are some errors in the database. And I said, uh, yes, of course, it's just the first version, you know. It's being cleaned up in the office at the moment. So uh, here's a piece of paper. You should write down any errors you notice. And I'll give them to our editors at the office in Chessbase. And he was sitting there with breakfast, and he said, okay, game 173, the result is wrong. It, was, it should be 1-0, it was 0-1. Game 212, uh, the name is and something like that, you know. And he listed three or four games. And I realized this kid not only memorizes all the games he's been watching at one game every two minutes, but he's also remembering the record number in the database. His hard disk was empty. He was just filling it. And so he helped us a lot. And... We often had Vichy here at Chessbase, not this building, but in our previous office, and I'd force him to do preparation in the office, and the programmers would stand there watching him, talking to each other and saying, okay, you know what he's trying to do? He's trying to do this and this and this, and next time he came, he would have a function there to implement. We did that with Gary as well, by the way. Do you remember an example or two? Yes, there's one example. <clears throat> Gary would look at a game, he'd play through it very fast, and then he'd go back to the list and click the next game and so on. We said, we need a, a key called next game, load next game. So we implemented F5. Now it's F11, I think. And you press F5 and it loads the next game and jumps to the position, which if Gary's looking at an opening, then it jumps to the uh, position which he was looking at. And this was called the Gary key, F5. Now it's F11. And this is how we worked, you know, with so many other players as well, with with uh, Kramnik and Shirov and so on. We just watched them. And our programmers would recognize what they're trying to do. And later, of course, we had discussions with some top players who said, you know, what we need to do is this and that and so on. And the programmers will say, yeah, okay. And make a function. So when does Anand first appear in your guest book? I think it's 1988. Yes, here. We have in 1988. Thank you very much, Ingrid and Fred. Happy Fred, in brackets. This is because when he came, he started calling me Mr. Friedel and my wife, Mrs. Friedel. And we said, come on. It's Fred and Ingrid. And so, for the most wonderful week I've had in a long time, thanks Martin and, and Thomas for the whackings in every computer game I saw in the house. I really don't know how to thank you all. Anyway, this was in on the 25th of uh, April, 1988. I think that was the first time he came. Yeah, so this is this great uh, leather guest book with a, with a, what is it, a cork cover? It starts in 1981? Yes, with Ken Thompson. 
the Unix person, who was the very first one, who says, Frederick and Ingrid, you must come to New Jersey and let Bonnie and me repay your hospitality. And this was in 1981, yes. And then was it that every time someone came, they had to write something? So when Vichy came, to, is Vichy in there 30 times? Yes. Or, yeah. okay. No, 30 plus times. I haven't cal- counted it again. We only uh, allowed people, or we asked people who spent the night there. And there you'll find people like uh, Gelfand uh, in... Nine, when he was 19, he came over. And Peter Leko, when he was 14, he came over and stayed. And Peter Leko could write in German. Yeah, he, he speaks absolutely fluent German. And Peter Leko uh, came and stayed in 19, oh, 1993, I can see here. And this is what he says. Peter Leko says, many thanks for everything. I hope that the next time I will be able to stay for at least a week. See you soon. That's, and you're translating I'm from translating what he wrote, yeah. into German. And then he came again and again. And with him, I used to fight a lot and argue because he had very outlandish views. He was a complete vegetarian. and You, could, you shouldn't cook vegetables. You must eat them raw. And after eating fruit, you had to spend 40 minutes waiting before you could eat vegetables or the other way around. So you had all these rules. And what I would do is, for example, I took a huge strawberry and I took little pieces of broccoli and stuck them into the strawberry and I showed it to him. And he turned completely pale and said, no, that's poison. And then I would eat it in front of him and show him that I didn't die. And my wife would say, why are you fighting with him? He's just 14. And I says, because he comes for more all the time. He's enjoying it. And we had a lot of fights. And at one stage, we agreed that in 10 years, we would meet again. And one of us would say to the other, you were right, and I was wrong. You were smart, and I was stupid. Did it ever happen? One one of you... Uh, yes, of course. He, he's a very conscientious person. He, uh, Yeah, he must have relaxed that over the years because we've certainly had uh, some, some nice meals together. He, we're exactly the same age or within six months. He's one of the nicest people I know. I've been friends with him. I met him again recently in Baden-Baden, and we had such a great time. He's a very affectionate person. He'll never forget that he spent part of his childhood in my house. And he grew up with my kids. You know, there's this one story I've written up. Chess base had developed the end game, Queen versus Rook. So one evening I asked him, uh, can you play, can you win with the Queen against the Rook? And he said, yes, of course, I can win. I said, well, show me. And he sat in front of my Atari trying to win. And he couldn't. And he was very frustrated. He said, what is this? Next morning at breakfast, I said, uh, did you sleep well? And he said, when I went to sleep, I slept well. I said, why? He said, I was awake for two hours. I said, why? Did Tommy, my son, who's exactly two years younger than him, uh, did he disturb you? He said, no, no, no. I was thinking about this end, end game. And mind you, he was 14 years old, yeah? And I said, well, do you think you can play it now? He said, yeah, yeah very easily. I can win it. And he started to describe the technique you have to use. And I said, show me. He said, come on, I can do it. So, so I put him in front of the computer, and he continued eating his breakfast and just playing instantly and immediately won. And so what I realized is this 14-year-old boy had solved the end game in bed at night and come the next day and knew how to play it. And I told Gary that you're going to have a challenger at some stage called Peter Leko. And he said, ah, yeah, I've heard of him. But, you know, Fred, you and your kids, you know, you're always bringing me new kids and telling me about them. And so let's wait and see. And and then I told him about this. And Gary said, okay, so I have to take him seriously, yes? And, of course, Peter went on to become a challenger for the world champion. He was almost there. He just lost the last game. Otherwise, he would be one of the world champions. Well, and the man he lost that match to was Vladimir Kramnik, who was actually introduced to you by Kasparov. Well, that was also a very 
nice little story. I went to a tournament in Dortmund, and I was there after round three or four. And uh, I entered the playing hall, and Gary was playing against Kamsky. And he looked up and saw me enter. And then he got up and walked to the front row and spoke, whispered to his wife. His wife then got up and came, and I was sitting down somewhere at the time, and she took me and led me out by the hand. out of the, And they wrote about this in the newspapers, that Kasparov was consulting Frederick Friedel through his wife or something like that. And she'd led me down the hall into the cellar, into the lower uh, places of the tournament hall, and where they were playing a giant open tournament, into a corner, and she read the names, and she said, that's him. I said, that's whom? And she said, Vladimir Kramnik. So I said, okay, and why are you showing me Vladimir Kramnik? And she said, because Gary told me to. So I said, okay. And that evening I asked Gary, oh, who's this guy, Kramken or whatever, Kramnik? Okay, Kramnik, why did you show me Kramnik? He said, this is a future world champion. This is a great player and so on. Kramnik was, I don't know, how old, 17 or 16 or something. And Gary was full of praise for him. And I said, just watch him, Fred, and you will see and so on. Later that year, I think it was, I might be getting dates wrong, but uh, Gary asked the Russian Chess Federation to include him in the uh, in the Olympiad team for Manila. And they said, who, Kramnik? We have 17 players who are senior. And Gary said, no, I want him. And they said, no, come on, this is a typical Kasparov. He has this idea, no way, and so on. And Gary said, okay, then... Uh, who's going to play first board? And they said, okay, are you blackmailing us? He said, blackmailing is such an ugly word. But, okay, I might be exaggerating, but he got Kramnik into the team. And they said, you know, this is a disaster. Of course, Kramnik went there and won all but one game. And he, he was the greatest success ever. And, of course, he went on to challenge Gary and to actually beat him and become world champion. Yeah, and this was uh, this would have been the early 90s, about 25 years ago. Um, pretty remarkable to think about that, uh, that this was already clear to Gary when he was still just a, just a teenager. Gary was spotting these talents. You know, one day he told us, he told us in a press conference in Hamburg, they asked him, do you know any potential challenger? He said, no, I don't know. Oh, maybe somebody called Kamsky. And everyone looked him up, who the hell is Kamsky? And then one of our uh, chess based people went to St. Petersburg and met Kamsky and said, I would like to talk to him because the world champion Gary Kasparov says that he is one of the top future players. And the trainer said, no, he can't have said that because who knows Kamsky? But he had spotted Kamsky. Kamsky, like that. one that doesn't appear in your guest book. No, Kamsky never came to... Home. But Kramnik visited not uh, long after that. 19, the, one of the first entries, I don't know if it's the first, where he came to stay in my home was in 1996. And he uh, wrote in my, this I can read, it's very nice. He wrote in my guest book, Thanks, Frederick. I'm having a very good time here. Even extremely poor play of Fritz Four against me cannot spoil it. He, he's, he played a number of games against Fritz. Uh, he's baiting me. The place is, is great. If I would live in such a place, I would soon become world champion. So thank you again for very nice treatment. And then he came a number of times, and it was always fun. He's one of the nicest people I know. Yeah, it's... Uh it's also interesting that this, in many ways, is a chronicle of the the chess base history and the, and the the evolution of of uh, computer chess uh, as well. Because uh, yeah, before we we uh, spoke that Leko coming the previous year had uh, said something about playing Fritz three. Here we have Kramnik playing Fritz four. Now we're up to Fritz sixteen. It's kind of let me just say that I witnessed this evolution. Uh, we launched Fritz one in. 
1991. And then a number of grandmasters, I mean everyone, Salo for Gelfand, anyone, was at my home, and they would try it out and say, oh, this is cute. I mean, it's not serious. It's nothing for us, but it's cute. It actually plays legal chess. And then we had Fritz three, and they said, well, you know, it's quite interesting. But, of course, it's nothing for us. Or Kramnik here at Fritz four, extremely weak, but it's cute. And then slowly it migrated to, well, it's getting really strong. And then it became, uh, listen, you leave me alone. Nobody must disturb me, lock themselves up in the room. And I remember sitting outside, and they're playing against Fritz five or six in my study. And then you would always hear, oh, damn, and curses and so on. Because, of course, at Fritz five and six, it was they're winning, 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 and then they lose. Winning, 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 then they lose. This is because they make a mistake. And I tried to explain to them, it's it's just you're terrified of making a mistake against a computer. And it happens, and the computer never makes a counter mistake. It just goes on to win. And then, of course, it evolved to the stage where they say, play against Fritz? Are you crazy? No, I'm not stupid, you know. So now nobody will even play. They'll use it in analyze. But to play against it, completely out of the question. So what we're doing at the moment is to try to teach Fritz to play weak games with human-like errors, which is very difficult, you know. But we're succeeding. Because it's not enough to just have something that makes mistakes and allows you to win, but it, it, it has to be fun. It has to feel like, like a human mistake. Yeah. Queen to g3, f takes g3. See, it made a mistake. No, that's nothing. That's the kind of thing that, that my first chess computers uh, set on level one would do. Yeah, or, or programs which try to play weak chess, they make just stupid mistakes, which, you know, what we're doing at the moment, and this, I think, is one of the most exciting areas of research we're doing at, the, at this time, is to teach it to set up errors for the opponent we have a baby mode where what it does is it tries to set up chances for the opponent which look exactly like they might encounter in games played on the beach against some amateur or in a chess club at the lowest levels. And this means that they have to, it has to try to set up something where a piece or a pawn is defended by two pieces, attacked by two pieces, but there is a way to uh, eliminate one of the defenders and then capture the piece. This is the kind of thing human beings do. And I think we're getting there. You know, I've, I've been playing against the baby mode and enjoying it tremendously because it plays abysmally bad. Uh, I mean, it plays like 1,000 level chess, but it makes very human mistakes. And I can see a human being sitting across from me and, you know, just ignoring the fact that I can eliminate a defender and then take a piece. Well, from all your time spent both with the software and also with the world champions developing chess base, has has your own chess level improved through osmosis? Or, no, uh, of course not. It's like if if you're a ball bearer to uh, Nadal, you don't become better at chess. Actually, I gave up chess when I was 19. I was a fairly strong player playing on board one of some tiny little chess club in Hamburg. But... Uh, the problem was I could not study openings. That, that, that was boring. So I was famous for playing fairly good chess without any openings knowledge. And I was a pure tacti tactician. But then I realized at some stage that it's addictive and I do not have the special faculties of the brain which you must have to become a strong chess player. And if I dedicated my life to chess did nothing else, no studies of philosophy, no family, no f friends, but just intense study, I could perhaps become a, a weak international master. And I realized I was at least intelligent enough to realize that is not something I want to aim for. And so the only way was to give it up completely, in my case. I had to give it up completely. And because it's a in in my case, it was addictive. I'd come home at 2 o'clock in the morning feeling miserable. 
and I'd sit there till four o'clock in the morning trying to figure out what I had done wrong and then spend much of the next day trying to work out the opening and then playing it against the same opponent and getting a draw and he would grab my books and say, oh, wait a minute, ah, that's what I did wrong and understood what I had done in a week in a few minutes. So he had a chest brain, I didn't. So essentially you made a deliberate effort not to work on your on improving your own chest. Absolutely. I took it up again a little bit when my second son, Tommy, became interested in chess and started playing tournaments and so on. I'd play blitz against him. And it was interesting, and it might be of interest to our uh, listeners, that what happened was I expected him to crush me after a short period of time. And so I was playing against him, and we played maybe hundreds of blitz games, and he never succeeded in actually crushing me. And I said, okay, maybe he's not making progress, but that was not the case. He was making progress, but I was digging up my chest from the past. I was also learning at that phase. But then I stopped again because, again, you start trying to become stronger and you start studying it and so on. And I just don't have the chess brain. And yet at the same time, your appreciation for chess and also the aesthetics of a beautiful combination or a beautiful study or something haven't diminished. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you're you're still very much uh, involved in, and consuming uh, chess. So, yeah, I mean, how would you sort of generally characterize your, your relationship with the game and, and how that's evolved? Okay, I became very involved in the game without playing because I had chess base and I was... Uh, First of all, doing a lot of documentation, contacts, and so on. And then for 20 years, as I mentioned, I ran the news page, which was three articles a day, which had to be, there was one, on average, three articles a day. There was one important criterion, which was it had to be interesting and fun. And uh, I did this and didn't miss a single day in 20 years. Christmas, holidays, uh, holidays, I never went on a holiday, but uh, birthdays and everything. Once I went to a place where in northern Sweden into the Arctic Circle where there was no internet. So I had to write three or four articles before we went. And then when I got back in Stockholm, I immediately uh, worked on it again. So I was constantly in touch with chess and looking for interesting subjects. My interests are in studies, in end games, in tactics, in helpmates, and in all these things, which are just a lot of fun. And so for the rest of my life, I'll probably supply you guys with just, you know, fun articles about people with stories like we're telling now, or studies, or problems, things like that, which I enjoy immensely, without actually playing. Well, we've talked a lot about the influence of computers. What about what else have you seen that's kind of um, an overarching theme or, or, or some kind of transformation in the chess world since you've been an observer of chess professionals, of, of chess learning? Yeah, an intimate observer of them because I, you know, I saw everyone from world champions to challengers to... Uh, even weaker players, or the strong grandmasters, tournament players, and so on, and see them working, and the effects our development of chess base has had on the chess world. And this sometimes is considered negative because, you know, when I go to a tournament in London, the London Chess Classic, they have two of my friends doing commentary, and when I enter after the game has been on for 15 minutes, I enter the commentary room, they have on two occasions at least said, oh, ladies and gentlemen, that's Frederick Friedel, the man who destroyed chess. This is Ali Motasavi. And he said, you know, chess used to be such a lot of fun. We just go there and crush everyone. Now you have young kids coming to us, extremely well prepared, and we have to work for it. And that's because of him and because of chess base and so on. But so what happens is, 
And we must realize that this is what Garry Kasparov did. He gave the tools which only he and Karpov and, and Portish or a few other people had to the entire world. So everyone could prepare. Now, people say there's a lot of over-preparation in chess. And to a certain degree, that's right. You know, they play 18 moves just off the board. And the danger is that at some stage, they will play 18 moves. And then one player will play the 19th move for the world championship. The other will think for 40 minutes and say, OK, I resign. This is tremendous. And so this is over preparation. But that is one thing. But the other thing is people are now playing, I think, much more daring chess. Because in pre-chess uh, base uh, years, what happened was you had an opening and you said, okay, but why can't I just take it? Because it requires two weeks of study to find out why you can't take it or that you can take it. So you said, no, no, we can't discuss that. Let's look at something else. So you had great ideas, but you couldn't follow up on them because it just took too much time. So since chess base, and especially with our very, very, very powerful engines, over 3,000 ELO, people say, why can't I just take it? And the program shows them in a few minutes why they can't take it. Or it says, well, well, maybe you can, you know, it's not a bad move and so on. And then they can start studying it. So people are studying more dangerous things. So there's a democratization of chess knowledge or diffusion of chess knowledge. C certainly. If you want to have exactly what Magnus Carlsen or, or Vichy Anand or Gary Kasparov at the time had as their tools of work, I would charge you, we would charge you a few hundred euros and you had it. And at the same time, that's, it sounds like you're making an argument f f that contrary to being the death of chess, it's actually breathed some new life into chess. In, in Invigorating chess, yeah, in some respects. In terms of uh, making it possible to explore areas that previously would have remained hidden. And getting, you know, you saw this 14-year-old boy who was here in our office with such a profound knowledge of chess extremely profound. He was analyzing with our endgame expert, Carsten Miller. And I went in there and I asked them, is he talented? And they said, he's, he's amazing. And uh, how did he do this? He could never have done, okay, he has some, a couple of very, very good trainers in India. This is uh, an Indian, uh, Nihal Sarin and the other one, who's maybe even stronger, Pragananda. And they have Ramesh and, and wonderful trainers. But they also have 24 hours of access to the most fantastic knowledge available to human beings in chess. Remember the difference between our age now and 20 or 30 years ago is that 20 or 30 years ago you spent in preparation for top players. You spent most of your time standing in front of a bookshelf and thumbing through books and putting little pieces of paper in that. You spent 80% of your time doing that and 20% of your time looking at the position on the board. Now you spend 5% of your time searching for something and 95% of your time actually looking at it and analyzing with a, together a 14-year-old boy sitting there finds what he's looking for, finds new ideas, and then analyzes them with a 3,000-level chess player, guiding him and saying, no, 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 you can't do that. Yes, you can do that. And you've also uh, been interested in, in the other end of the spectrum, the beginner end of the spectrum, and, and uh, chess education a little bit. What do you see as the, the future of the uh, chess tools for children I think it's very, very important for children to learn chess. And that's why I'm trying to introduce it in chess in schools, to introduce schools to the concept of having a chess group. I want one hour of uh, chess in the normal weekly schedule or 
a few hours in the afternoon in groups. And the reason I tell them is not to generate new world champions and grandmasters and so on, but to teach children something unique which you can learn from chess. It's fun, they enjoy it, and they uh, learn a few things. I'll tell you this in the example of my son, Tommy. When Tommy was seven and eight, I told you I played a lot of blitz against him. He became very ambitious and he used to go to a chess club. And by the way, his trainer was Matthias Feist, who programs chess base. And Tommy was playing there and in a town very close by. And at one o'clock in the afternoon, my wife would say, you've got to pick him up. You know, he's, uh, he's probably finished his game. So I'd drive there. And I'd see Tommy sitting at a chessboard like this and staring at it. And then he'd look up and see me and he'd say, no, 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 I, I'm, go away, I'm working. And I realized he's been sitting there for four hours. And he's like nine years old and staring at the board and working on a problem which is this size. And what did he learn there? He learned, of course, logic and combination and strategy and responsibility for everything he does. But he also learned and mainly to concentrate on one task. And at the time, I did some measurements on his classmates. What is their attention span? And it turns out it's like 16 seconds. You, know? you can do this by using long and complex sentences and watching when they sort of look away because they've lost you. And he, he's become a very, very proficient programmer, top-level programmer. And if you ask him, how can you do the things you're doing? You know, learn a new programming language, uh, write a backbone for a huge system all in 36 hours. He says, I learned to concentrate when I was playing chess. So everyone should play chess, in, learn chess in school at the age of seven, eight, nine years old and they learn how to concentrate. And we're doing some very interesting projects now uh, to introduce chess in schools and to have schools playing against each other, which has become so easy because you can do it on the internet. You know, you can have chess groups, and we're trying to do one, we're going to do one now between an elite school here in Hamburg and a school in Beijing, which Ho Yifan, one of my best friends, has uh, found for us. And they're going to play against each other, you know, four boards or eight boards. And they can do it once a month or every two weeks. And then in the end, they can send a group of kids to Beijing or send a group of kids from Beijing to Hamburg and make friends. But do it through chess. When when Tommy was learning at home, <clears throat> did he get to play against uh, the 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 players who stayed in your house? Was all he learning them. from them as well? He played against all of them. All of them. And I had to tell them, you know, don't let him win. And I remember Spielman said, Spielman, John Spielman said, of course not. I will never let him win. And he played against all of them and had a lot of fun. He played about 30 games against Vichy Anand at breakfast usually. And the score was 29 to 1. What was the one? The one was when Vichy got involved in conversation with me. And Tommy suddenly said, you lost on time. <laughs> so he has one game. And did you? was your house filled with, with chess books as well? Yes, we have a lot of chess books, but they're diminishing because, uh, you know, chess books are a mystery to me, especially books which have lots of games in them. What do you do? You see a game, there's a diagram, you go to the diagram, and then you try to play three moves in your mind, and then you've lost it. The number of people who actually go to their cupboard and f pull down a chessboard and put up the pieces and reconstruct the game and play through them and so on, I can't imagine that's very large. What about chess books that are more narrative, more of a collection of stories? Yes, of course, and which have a diagram and then some of the moves, and not too many moves, and lots of diagrams, and narrative in them. Yeah, that's fine. And I have lots of those. What comes to mind uh, that you could recommend to the listeners? Leonard Baden, uh, John Nunn, uh, what was his name? Solving in Style, one of 
book I've read from cover to cover maybe twice or three times. It's about end games. And there are so many Chernev, you know Chernev, and uh, Lasker, Edward Lasker, and so on. I've read, I read, remember reading Edward Lasker growing up. Yeah, there were a lot of good, good stories, as well as instructional content. And there are a lot of German books I have. Helmut Pfleger has written a number of books. He did, he does a column. And he does it exactly right. He has a chess diagram. He tells a story. He shows you a few moves. And this is what you can put together in a book. Have any of Helmut Flager's books been translated? I don't think so. But I have half a dozen of them. Mm -hmm. Leonard is still alive and writing his column. He's almost 90. Uh, And he writes a column every single day. And these are very interesting columns. I just had a quick look. He has books, Barden, going back to the 60s, even. Chess Puzzles or something it was called. Chess Puzzle book was in in 1977. Yes. That's the book I have close access to. It's on my shelf, so I can just lean over and reach out and get it. And I've used it for 1977 till today. Well, probably 1980 till today. I've used that book and I've derived such a lot of pleasure and such a lot of material from that book. Yeah, all right. So you did a a, a fantastic series on uh, Bobby Fischer in Iceland last year, 14 parts. Well, that could be a whole podcast in and of itself, this, this series, but um, maybe just one or two uh, highlights or what, what would you uh, recommend people, people uh, have a look at in that uh, series? No, I never met Fisher, but I wrote to him since his world championship against Spassky, and he was in – we can do a podcast on Spassky, by the way. That is really interesting, one of the big influences on, on my life. Anyway – I, I used to write letters to Fisher, never got an answer, of course. And then a few years, like two years before his death, his best friend, no, I'll say his only friend in Iceland, Gada Sverison, called me and said, uh, Fisher wants you to come to Iceland to discuss something. I said, okay, fine, this is great. Uh, I get to meet him. He said, no, no, you don't get to meet him, but to discuss it with me. I said, no, I'm not going to come to discuss it with somebody else. Why don't you come to my home? So Gada said, okay, I can do that. And he did come, and he's become a friend for life. He's a very interesting, very nice person. I've written in my articles, I think in uh, in number two of the series, uh, it describes exactly who he is and how he lives and how he was a friend of Fisher. And I've written about his books as well. He's written a couple of books. He's written a book about the last years of Fisher. Anyway, Gada came, but before he could come, uh, before he arrived in Hamburg, I was just about to leave the house when the phone rang, and I looked at my family and I said, should I take it? Yeah, I'll take it. And I took it, and somebody said, is this Mr. Frederick Friedel? I said, yes. He says, this is Bobby Fisher. I said, come on, are you sure? You thought it was a prank call. Well, <laughs> he said, yes, uh, I need to discuss this and that. And, and But he mentioned Gardas very soon, so I knew, okay, it could, it is probably Fisher. And I said, I've been writing to you for 20 years, and suddenly out of the blue you call. You never reacted before. And you said, uh, no, 25 years. Because didn't you write to me in Pasadena? Then, uh, so it was absolutely genuine. And then his idea was he had invented a new form of chess called uh, new chess or something like that with uh, the random pieces. It was a random chess. He wasn't calling it Fisher random chess originally. No, he was calling it the new chess. And the old chess is completely dead because it, it's all preparation now and so on. And this was before the new Cokes, or so, so no, I guess it could have been after. So you wouldn't know that that was a branding uh, dead end. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, he had invented a new game and he, he, he had go- had the idea, uh, I want to play the world champion Anand uh, in this new chess. 
And he had decided we need a sponsor for a couple of million dollars. And who can we take? Chess base, that's it. Chess base will sponsor this. And I said, no. <laughs> First of all, we don't do this and we can't afford it. And secondly, uh, there's no exclusivity. If you play a match, you know, everyone will cover the match and so on. And that's not the way you do it. You have to announce that you want to do something like this in a press conference. And then uh, some company, maybe a car manufacturer in South Korea or someone will say, we'll do it. And they can pay for it. And then it becomes an international event promoting that car company or something. You don't decide which company is going to do it. And so I had lots and lots of conversations with him over a month or two months. Uh, and he would call and uh, I also had his number and I would call him. And we had these our long conversations and it was amazing. He was a very intelligent person. He had access to humor because I can't resist. I was teasing him all the time, making fun and so on. And he would really think about things I said. You know, I would contradict him and I assumed always if you contradict him, it's over. But he'd call the next day and said, I've been thinking what you said the error in your thoughts is the following, and then we debate that. Maybe I can write a little bit about this because we decided there was an embargo on anything we discussed for 10 years after one of us dies. We are there. We are now there, yes, yeah, of course, 10, 10 years, years ago. since his death. So maybe I'll write something about it. And I actually recorded some of our conversations just to make sure that I have proof that I'm not just inventing all of this, but I realized that was illegal, so I'm not able to use them or show them. Did you take a lot of contemporaneous notes? No. So, yeah, then... Uh, These were conversations. He'd call me at 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and but the next morning, you couldn't write down? <laughs> no. Well, I've stored it all in my brain. It's very, it's very, very uh, lucid, what we discussed and and the debates we had. And Although the memory uh, over time does funny things to stories like that. Uh, <laughs> if you were we talking about Fisher, you yeah, know, right. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, it's a pity that the recordings... But you had some recordings? Do you still have some recordings? No. No. Let's say no. <laughs> All right. Well, maybe they emerge. I mean, 10 years after his, his death uh, would be interesting to hear some, some One recordings of the that are not that are not things that were broadcast on Philippine television all about the Jews. <laughs> yes. About 4% of our conversation was assuring him and me. I used to pretend that I was also worried about it. I would tell him, you know, you mustn't publish what I'm saying now. He said, me publish where? I said, no, but I don't want you to publish this. But he... 4% of our conversations was about how this had to be kept private. Gardas Sverison is the only person who uh, knows about this. When he was in my home, Bobby called, and we had this sort of conference call where Gada was listening in and talking and so on. So Gada knows about this. One last thing about world champions. Uh, at some stage, you know, world champions and challengers, you see them all in my little book here. And at some stage, Gary said to me, Fred, are you incubating challengers for me? <laughs> because, you know, whenever there was a challenger, yeah, he's someone who's been to Fred's home for, uh, for 17 times or four times or seven times or whatever. And I told him, yeah, yeah, of course, they come to my home and drink the water. And this makes them world champion or challengers. And unfortunately, uh, Magnus Carlsen has disproved this because he only almost made it to my home. You know, I used to look after him when he was in his mid-teens instead of his father and would be at tournaments with him. And we were at Dortmund, and he was supposed to come to my home and then proceed to Oslo. But after the event, he was so tired. And I looked at him and said, get on the plane, fly straight to Oslo. And so he almost made it, but he never actually came, and he never actually drank water. So 
apparently that theory is has a flaw. So who is uh, who's at the end of the guest book? Right now at the end of this guest book. It's still ongoing. This is one book. It's not multiple yeah, yeah, editions. Because you're starting to run out of pages. Yeah. Nihal Sarin, Ho Yi Fan. Here. We can, uh, you can read it to the audience here. <laughs> yeah, my, my Chinese script uh, is not so high level. No, Yi Fan was there, and that was just marvelous with her. She's such a wonderful person. I have offered her adoption. I want to adopt her, but apparently, no. How many, how many pages is left? Not many. How many years left for me? <laughs> Not many. Uh, and Vesley So with Lotis was there. That was really lovely. Although they, they wouldn't have stayed over, probably. No, they were at a hotel close by. You've relaxed this rule about having to have spent the night there to be in the guest Well, room. they spent a whole day and till late in the evening and so on. And then I went to the hotel, so it was, it was okay. That was just this this past year. Yes. But you know, we we and Tanya Sachdev is also there, and she stayed, and Almira Skripchenko and so on. And but you know, we're getting on in years, and now we have. I have two wonderful, wonderful grandchildren. So we're cutting back on saying, you're a chess player, you can come and stay. Well, I really like about the guest book is the fact that it's all in their handwriting. It's contemporaneous, so they, so it's a, it's a chronicle of history. And to see also the, the, the juxtapositions on a page inadvertently sometimes is interesting. So, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely very keen on, on trying to get this yeah, we should as a, a historical series, artifact yeah. scanned really in its entirety and then just have it uh, unlock some memories from these visits that can turn into a whole series. It's also funny, you know, because I'll give you one little example. I can't find it now immediately, but I can tell you what it was about. We had Valery Salov there who was one of the top ten in the world at the time. And he stayed for a week. He brought his wife with him and so on. And then he, I confronted him with the guest book. And he wrote something like, I'm in the deepest uh, stages of depression because I can't think of anything to write in your guest book which would be adequate to, and so on. And it's just total misery. And then he came back a few years, a year later or something, and you should read his his uh, his entry in our guest book. It says, "My stay reminds me of the poem by Pushkin," and then he writes the whole thing. What was this? He's a chess player. He did preparation. He knew what was coming, so he'd done preparation, and he was ready for the guest book. So there's a lot of funny stuff in there. Also, Nigel, of course, he's very, very cheeky and funny in his entries. Well, I, I would definitely look forward to that. I've had a, a little bit of a sneak peek, but uh, but really just scratched the surface. And Yes, I, I promise you will do a series. I think it'll be a great entree into some of the, the chess history that, that is uh, locked up in your and brain. You know what I discovered after you came to my home and saw all of this? I pulled out all the negatives I have, black and white negatives from the early ages of chess. And the article, the recent article on Nigel Short and position recognition resulted from your visit and Carsten Müller came and saw these. And now I've started scanning them. And so we can do stories from the, from 40 years ago or 30, 30 years ago. And these these are, you, you should see some of these players, you know. Gelfand at 19 and, and Leko at 14 and so on. Well, that's a good place to, to stop. We've come back around full circle. Uh, thanks very much for sharing some of these stories. And uh, yeah, we look forward to uh, publishing more on Chess Base uh, as well. You're very welcome. You realize I'm on the wrong side of the lens here and the microphone. Usually I was, would be doing what you're doing right now, but it was fun. 
The new Perpetual Chess theme music is courtesy of Geert Vandervelt. Special shout out to him. I also want to thank everyone who supports the podcast. That includes people who tell their friends about it, people who write positive reviews on Apple Podcasts, and most of all, those who have donated to support the show. I spend about five hours a week on each episode, and even though I love doing it, it can be hard to find the time. Without the support of my Patreon and PayPal Perpetual Chess partners, the show would not be possible. They are Adam Ralph, Adam Van Couge, Adrian Gutierrez, Andres Krizdewa. I hope I did okay there, Andres, on your name. Alex Pejas, Chris Wainscott, Chad Hilton, Chris Lott, Christopher Wood, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Chris Flanagan, Daniel Naylor, Daniel Schaefer, Gary Andrews, Greg Shahadi, James Bonastia, Jason Dunbar, Jennifer Valens, Jeffrey Martello, John Fernandez, Jen Shahadi, Jen Scream, Jerry Wells, John Thompson, Johnny McMenamin, Kelly Palmer, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Lorraine Dore, Matthew Passy, Macaulay Peterson, Matthew Tedesco, Pascal Charbonneau, Paul Sweeney, Peter Lux, Peter Merrifield, Randy Temple, Ricky Grijalva, Rob Lazorchek, Robert Steiner, Tatia Vabrahamian, Thomas Stonix, Thomas Tachenko, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Todd Bryant, Tony Rotello, Victor Vrenkul, Zhao Cheng, and Zhivko Stoyanov. Thanks a lot, everyone. I'll be back next week with another great...